Welcome. I'm Pam Larricky from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Ben Lovejoy. Hi, Ben. Hey, Pam. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, just as a little introduction, I first met Ben many years ago, and I think we just figured out it was 2003, which was at the first unschooling conference that we ever went to. And I have loved catching glimpses of his family's unschooling lives and beyond over the years, and I'm so happy he agreed to come on the podcast to share his experience and insights with us. So to get us started, Ben, can you share with us a little bit about you and your family and what everybody's up to? Sure. Well, first, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's good catching up with you before we really got started. Yeah, yeah. It was lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess take it back just a little bit. So, of course, I was in the military for a while, um, ended up um, retiring from the Air National Guard and. December of 2013, um, and uh, Kelly and I had bought a piece of land, I guess, um, probably about two to four years before that, and springing forward a bit, we moved up to North Carolina, and we built a house on the piece of land that we had. Um, actually, I had to go over to Iraq for a while to make a little money for the family. Um, Kelly and the boys actually built the house. Kelly was our general contractor. And the boys are there to help her do that. So I did come back you know, safe and sound. Um, and how I've been working as, yeah, it was pretty, pretty interesting. That's for sure. <clears throat> but I came back and I'm working as a business development director for um, some um, physical therapy clinics. And uh, Kelly continues to work on the farm. And we, are, uh, we got a grant uh, this year to set up a website, do a lot of stuff. So that's her new project that she'll be working on for quite some time. <laughs> um, Cameron came home. He was our foreman. And uh, he came home uh, for that build. And uh, before that, he was down in, in New Orleans, um, which he absolutely adores. He's a swing dance teacher. Um, he's a poet. Um, and just recently, he started a bookbinding business. And he is getting ready to launch. Um, He's getting uh, a bigger uh, piece of the pie, if you will, um, getting some extra uh, equipment and stuff like that. He's launching a GoFundMe, GoFundMe campaign or one of those yep, yep. campaigns. Yep, yep. yep, I think his launch is on the 16th of March, which is next Saturday. So he is really busy getting ready for that. Um, Duncan actually is in school. He's finishing up his associates in math uh, probably later this um, summer. Um, although all the math classes are done, he's finishing up some of the prerequisites like um, one of the sciences he has left to do. So he's at home. Um, he, in his off time, he does a lot of storytelling through D&D &D and creating characters and all that stuff. Um, he actually has been a stage manager at a local theater um, for several plays, which he's enjoyed. And uh, somebody in one of those D&D groups has asked him if he wanted to do that some more, but uh, I'm not sure what he's going to do. We'll, we'll see how that goes. That's the fun thing, right? Is the fun, there's just right? so many, so um, many options, options and opportunities, options. right? That they can, yeah. that yeah. they, and it's just always fun to see what comes in and, and which way they go because you, you, you don't know. I mean, yeah, you have an idea, but there's just so many, so many places that they could take it, right? It's just really fun to yeah. see what they decide. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, uh, you know, for Cameron, so he, you know, he did drumming. He did some filmmaking. He did a magic before that. Um, he's been writing pretty much the whole time. Um, and we'll get in, you know, to how the journey started and everything. But, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch. And, you know, I'm thinking that some of the things that, that Cameron pulled out of that, you know, some of those skill sets are still being used wherever he is. So. Oh, that's, that's another fascinating piece is because even when something seems like it's a little different, you, when you look back, you see the thread of what it is that they got out of it, right? So whatever choices they're making, right. sometimes you don't even know what it is that they're getting or what it is they're enjoying. But when you look back, you can start to see the thread of commonality between it all, even though it looks so different, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, Duncan, Duncan surprised us recently. He and Cameron went down to a folk art school this past uh, summer or last summer, I should say. And Duncan went down to do oil painting and you know, they show the first thing and there's a piece of fruit and some oranges and stuff like that. And you see that. And then the next picture you see, it's like, and this is all in a week. And, I'm, and so we're getting there going, well, wait a minute. Now we have two artists, you know, it's just, it was phenomenal. It was so cool. maybe the math kind of puts it all together. In, in perspective, mind. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. There, there is an art to math. Anyway, okay, so uh, we'll we'll go we'll go on to the next question because as we already told each other, our conversation's gonna wander, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. It sure um, will. So yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about how you guys discovered unschooling way back then, and what your family's original move to unschooling looked like. Sure, um, we have to go back actually when Cameron was. Uh, a little guy. Um, so I was full time in the military. Um, we knew that we would probably move around a bit. We started looking at the opportunity for homeschooling, you know, right during the time that we were probably on the way to go to an overseas assignment. Um, that didn't pan out necessarily. We came back. Um, again, we looked at other alternatives and whatnot. Um, and then the job led us back to Columbia, South Carolina, which is where Kelly grew up. Um, and so we decided we were going to um, put Cameron into the school that Kelly went to as a young girl. Um, <clears throat> after a little piece of time and, and the aforementioned magic, because he was extremely talented with that for a while, um, he one day said, uh, you know, he was being invited to go into this realm of, of magicians who were mentoring him and kind of a secret society, if you will. Um, and Kelly said, you know, you, you can't go on Sunday night because Monday you have a paper due. And he said, you know, I wouldn't have a paper due if I didn't have to go to school. And so we kind of <laughs> stepped back and, you know, <laughs> as, as it were, I, I think I, I heard that story about a month after it happened, just because I think Kelly wanted to make sure that she kind of grasped it and pulled it yeah. all together and stuff. And <laughs> so... <clears throat> But anyway, that, that was kind of the start. And then by the end of that summer, um, of his six, after he finished his sixth grade, that, that, was, that was when we decided to do that. Um, getting into unschooling, so there were uh, AOL lists, a lot, a lot of email lists that people were on. Um, Kelly you know, was kind of going through that and commenting, reading everything, just devouring whatever she could about it is what she ended up doing. And of course, I was still, you know, providing the living that we were having. So, um, you know, I'd get bits and pieces of it when I got home. Um, so that was kind of how we got started. It was more of a school at home thing. We didn't necessarily have times or tricks or anything like that. Um, Cameron was, the de-schooling process took a, a bit of time. Um, you know, some of the kids were kind of mean about it. You're going to be an idiot. You're going to be stupid. You're not going to grow up to be anything and stuff like that. And I think he kind of, you know, he still missed his friends and seeing his friends and stuff like that. Um, but I think about 14, we started seeing some stuff going on. You know, we had seen his um, lack of interest in school after a while. Mm -hmm. um, I like to refer to E.T. It was kind of like his heart light went out. Oh. And um, so he, you know, probably about 14 or 15 that started coming back. You could tell he, he was out of the uh, creek, if you will. And, he, you know, so anyway, it was just, it, and then it just blossomed from there. It's, it's been a really good journey for, you know, for him and for Duncan for that matter. Yeah. So did Duncan ever end up going to school at all? No, no. first, first class. <clears throat> and that's an interesting story. So he, um, Duncan's first class was at um, a college. Basically, he's at a, he went to a community college. And they have, I thought it was really terrific what they do. So if, if someone is not um, good on math or English, you know, you, you, you do a report for the English and then you do a few problems, I guess, for the math. And if they find that you need to do something like you need a little bit more before you get into the college credits, they do something called DMA. 
And so as a DMA student, he had to learn, you know, the arithmetic, you know, division, multiplication, subtraction, all that stuff. And then it kind of, I guess it cast, uh, uh, probably elevated up a bit. So he may have done some algebra problems or at least pre-algebra. And uh, it was a pass-fail kind of thing. So he went through that. Well, spring forward a couple of years, and guess who one of the math tutors is for the DMA kids? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's really, really nice. It really is nice. And they, they really like him. I don't think he has any Yelp reviews yet, but I think they really like having him there. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's, I, I love hearing those stories because so often I think, um, and we had talked about this, uh, I talked with Sue Patterson a few weeks ago, but how um, parents often worry that if their kid wants to, oh, what, what is my kid going to be behind if they want to go to college, right? Because they're still thinking um, at that at that. Uh, that level I'm, I'm not having the right words you know they they still have that expectation of a certain level by a certain age right whereas sure um you know duncan was learning all sorts of things up until that point you know he's got a different life experience than than the other kids who spent 12 years in school getting to that point that, so, you know, the biggest point is it's not that they're behind. It's just that they weren't focused on that, right? So when his choice was that's what he wanted to do, so he spent those couple of semesters or however long it was picking up that. It's not that he was behind. It's that now this is something I want to pick up, right? And then look how fast. Like he said, now he's tutoring people doing it. Just because you don't have that yet, doesn't mean you're behind there's something wrong that that you're gonna forever be behind or anything like that it's just different choices isn't it right exactly and i think part of that too is so you know the expectation of society is also very powerful yeah because of course you've got adults who are around who aren't necessarily buying into what you're doing um how's it going to go to college i mean it's it's a frequent thing but it's not a solid um conversation a lot of times they say it within the earshot of the child, you know, it's your child, you know, so it's up to you to kind of, if you're going to have that conversation with somebody, you know, you, you, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the person you're talking to, and you, you, you definitely owe, owe it to your child to have that conversation with that adult, you know, separate from their ears, in my opinion. So, yeah. anyway. That's a great point. Great point. That's great. Okay. So let's focus a little bit on your um, journey to understanding unschooling, because as you mentioned, you came from a military background. That's where you were working. I imagine that was a big shift at first, was it? Yeah. So the journey is still going on. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. Yeah. So, yeah it is. It is. Um, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. And, you know, I, I uh, have considered that back and forth and stuff and I I can be glib and say that I always had some kind of a of a streak to do something a little different but but I think one of the things that I was telling actually a group of, of um, um, enlisted men they were they were enlisted men and women they were at a point in their career where there there's a professional military education that they need to do and all the way up into that point you're being told teamwork, teamwork, the team's more important, the mission's important, and this and that and this. And so they invited me to come in to say something to them. And they, you know, they, I'm sure they were expecting me to talk about, you know, good followers, you know, teamwork and all that stuff. And I asked them, I said, how are you going to set yourself apart? And they and they looked at me like, well, that's just not the way we are. I said, well, think about it. I said, by the time you get to the point where, you can be that man or woman who's going to be the highest enlisted rank. There's only 1% of you in this room who's going to get that rank. My point was you've got to do something to differentiate yourself. And so to me, that was kind of the way I looked at myself. Well, you've, you've made these rank changes because you've done things differently. Why don't, why don't you look at your, I guess, your family life the same way? And that was part of what I looked at, I think, honestly, to get to this point. Oh, wow. So what was... Um... So I took my own advice. You did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you definitely took it. <laughs> yeah, it took a long time, but I, I, I did. Yeah, and I, you know, I think too. You know, part of it, I think, I think is again, as somebody who has grown up a certain way, and, and there's a lot that you've got to let go of. And I think, <clears throat> I think part of that is. Maybe you felt like you've defined yourself a certain way or something like that, and therefore you've got to continue with that. Well, no, you don't. I mean, you really don't have to do that. And so it just took, I think it took me a little bit longer to, to make that, that um, transition, if you will. Um, Kelly was all about it. Um, Cameron was all about it. I think once the, the de-schooling kind of started, and that actually helped a lot for me just to watch what he was doing, understand a little bit more about it, reading more about it, going to conferences, you know, putting on conferences, all that led to, you know, to, to my transition, I think. Yeah. So really it was, it was, you know, surrounding yourself with, with the information, with people that are doing it and just, and having an open mind about it, right. To think for yourself. Right. I think so. I think all those things helped open my mind. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately it's my responsibility, but I think, you know, all of those things, you know, when, when you're around kinder people, you can be kinder. You know, when you're around funny people, you try to be funnier. I'm not sure that you are, but, but you can <laughs> be, you know, so, so I think just kind of watching other people and how they, how they had done it was, was, was a smart, smart decision to make there. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Now, one of the areas that I know I've heard you speak about and uh, have really enjoyed is is the dichotomy between rules and principles. And I, I think that's something that's near and dear to your heart because I hear you talk about, have heard you talk about it. And and I think it's a really significant shift in de-schooling for people. So I'd love to dive into that with you. So I'd like to look at how... Um, rules get in the way of learning and how does the shift to principles help open things up? Well, I think so in one case, let's talk about the rules a little bit. I think yeah. that there are certain um, rules in learning, let's say in a college environment or any kind of school environment. If you go down that road, if you will, and you are a math major, um, I think there are certain things that happen. There are rules of math that if you don't follow, you may not understand how you get to the end of the problem. The principle would be is to figure out another way to get there without using those same structured rules because there have been changes in math, I think, that have changed over the years because somebody tried something differently. That may not be the best example, but there are rules that because they are set there for for the purposes of safety. Maybe obviously math may not be a safety <laughs> hazard or anything like that. <clears throat> but I'm talking about the military. Maybe first responders. There are certain things that you have to you know, maybe you have to do. Um, but the principles, <clears throat> you know, to me, there's a reason it's called self-discipline because it's up to you. It's not up to anybody else to do that. It's up to you. So it's kind of that way. It's an intrinsic thing. If you know that something is not right, then why do you continue to do it? Well, you know, I'm trying to break the rules. No, no, that's, that's a personal thing. So that's an intrinsic thing. I think rules are more on the outside. It's something that somebody else has created. Um, you're supposed to just follow them and just move on. And again, maybe there are certain situations where people's lives are at stake you know there's a certain way of doing things that you have to stay with that but not in general life but not in general learning either um you know the people who create um maybe not maybe they didn't even go to school that would be one thing so to say that they're unsuccessful because they didn't go to school but yet they launched you know amazon if, if he's not you know that sort of thing or yeah. or uh uh, Zuckerberg or a lot of you know a lot of actors for that that you know for that matter so um, I'm not sure I answered I hope I did <laughs> <laughs> yeah well no I think that was a, that's a great point I mean I think I mean rules have can have value right I mean certainly they can have reasons etc but as you were saying 
so many in general life we've just taken on as conventional rules, I think mostly as shortcuts to not have to think about the process, right? Certainly as parents with kids, so often, conventionally at least, we just pull out rules just to, uh, you know, control that moment as quickly and efficiently as possible, right? And it's not not taking the time to explain why, right? Just to open up the question, like why that rule is that way and then have the conversation, you know, if your child thinks of another way, like you were, like you were saying, right? Maybe there's another way to do it that gets us to the same endpoint that we're looking for. Right. And, and it can be completely, you know, more creative, a different way, some way that works better for them or, or a discussion around whether do we even want to get to that end point, right? Do we even really need to right. get there, right? So it right. really well, lot, it up. Yeah, I'm sorry. A lot of the times it is about that. I think it's, you know, the rules are there, you know, your parents or grandparents did it and you think that's the easiest way instead of stepping back a minute and going, okay, are you doing this for yourself or are you doing it for them? Yeah. You know, are, are the rules there for for you, like you said, to control the moment or, or you know, I don't want to be bothered by this. So this is the way it's going to be and let's get to that point so we don't have to worry about it and we can move on. But they're not trying to move on. They're trying to understand. And so, you know, your your intent on moving on and their, their need to understand are sometimes diabolically, <laughs> I hate to use that, but they are diabolically <laughs> opposed. <laughs> right, right. It's right. true. <clears throat> it really is. And, you know, it, it kind of comes in with, you know, as, as they get over, you know, the teenage years, what did you do about that? And it was like, nothing. I mean, nothing really. Same thing. There, 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 were no, there were no rules for them. Mm-hmm. There didn't need to be. They were already kind of self-disciplining, self-disciplining themselves. But as I said, that's why it's called self-discipline. So anyway, because, because, and I think so much of it is because when we take the time to, instead of just pull out a rule to have a conversation about what's going on in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. So much learning is happening there. And there's so much learning about themselves, about why they do or don't want to do this, how they prefer to do or not do, you know, there's just so much learning about themselves and, and about the environment, right? Because, you know, right. you're looking at the constraints in the environment and working that out into your discussion. So, like you said, by the time they're teens, you know, they have so much of that knowledge. And your conversations are just the little new bits, the, the new nuances, right. you know, for maybe they're going further, you know, thinking of different things, et cetera. But right. you, don't, you don't need the rules to control them. Even then, it's, it's just the same thing. Conversations just kind of change up, right? Right, right. And then the other thing is, I mean, if if they establish a pattern of things to make decisions and stuff like that, those are their, their decisions to make. So they're going to be much more comfortable if they're in a position where they have to make a split second decision because they've been there before. Instead of going, oh, what would mom or dad think? And by that time, it's it's too late. You mm-hmm. know? So, oh, I love that point. I love that point. Because they're so used to making these kinds of decisions, right? Because they've right. had that experience yeah. for years. that And they've gained confidence in themselves. You know, that self-discipline, right. self-awareness, you know, all of that it is at their fingertips now. So like you said, right. like in and that it- split second. Yeah. And even the awareness of saying, you know, calling at two thirty in the morning and saying, you know what, I, I can't get home, but I need to get home. Okay. Where are you? You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'll, because I'll be there in fifteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, because we've established that relationship and that trust and that connection that they'll they know that will help them out when they find themselves in that situation. In, in any kind of situation right. where, where they need help, they'll ask for it. And, you know, they give that back too. I mean, look at them coming, Cameron coming and being the foreman for your house build. You know, you guys had a need what? and he came and, and helped out, right? It's, it's a give and take relationship, isn't it? Right. And I think the other thing is this, I mean, this is kind of another example. So we had some kind of a gathering in Columbia for some reason and, People came down from, you know, Minnesota or Boston or wherever they came from, and they ended up 
you know, the parents would, there wasn't enough room at our house for everybody to stay there. But of course, all the kids wanted to stay there because all the other kids were there. Yeah. Well, there was a, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the children came in and woke me up and said, I, I, I want to go back to the, to the hotel. I want to be with my mom and dad. And I was like, no problem. You know, so I'm telling you that because I think as, you know, as parents of our own children, it's one thing, but to have um, other children who are that comfortable with adults, not just their parents, to ask that question means that they're self-aware of what their needs are as well. So it doesn't just happen just with your kids necessarily. It, it happens with all the children who are doing this or have done this over the years. Yeah, yeah, this this yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. That is something that I have seen over and over, you know, when, especially, you know, when unschooled teens get together, you know, even the kids, you know, it's not just teens who have this level of awareness, um, it, but it, right. you know, it's just amazing. And the longer that they've been doing it, you really can see the difference in self-awareness, in understanding themselves and in um, often just reading the environment, right? And adjusting to what, you know, versus kids who haven't had that opportunity, right? right. I don't want to even say school kids. It's the opportunity to make choices and, and, and evaluate decisions and, and just have those conversations with their parents. That's, that's yeah. what gives them that level of skill, right? Yeah. I think, I mean, it, <clears throat> it, it would be easier to say that the kids who, who are with, you know, adults between, you know, three in the afternoon to nine at night, you know, if, 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 if there's, if they're put off as far as not being seen as important in their own parents' eyes, and they're going to see the same thing right or wrong. They may see the same thing with other adults as well in their mind. They're perceiving it as that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know it was, <laughs> that that just reminded me you know sometimes when you might have had that experience too when they had friends who were in school and weren't used to that kind of relationship with an adult and they would be coming and visiting and and you'd see over the months right <laughs> over over a few months maybe even it took a year until they got to the level of comfort where they knew i was different from other adults and they could come and talk to me or ask for things right. or make comments. You know, it took a while for them to realize that it, they could have a different kind of relationship with an adult than they were used to. Right. Yeah. We, we had that, that home at, in, in Columbia. I mean, that was the way that it was. And um, one of Cameron's friends, um, she actually came out to her parents who were extremely, um, they were extremely opposed to it. And she ended up coming to our house mm -hmm. and just needing to be with Cameron because, you know, he was her friend and, and she was his friend and vice versa and stuff. So, um, <clears throat> um, her dad came to the house, he knocked on the door and he said, you know, I'm, I need, I need my daughter. And I said, I'd like to come into your house. And I said, well, you're not invited into my house. Mm -hmm. And long story short, they actually, uh, the, her mother had a brother who was a lawyer who said that he sent us a note to cease and desist and all this stuff. And so we kept the letter, you know, and as we were leaving the neighborhood, um, the father, after three or four years had said, you know, I was really sorry that that kind of went down. Y'all were really good neighbors and, you know, she learned a lot and I'm glad she's doing okay. and stuff like that. And, you know, so anyway, it was kind of interesting how to see it. It came full circle, even for an adult in that case, you know, to say something. I'm not sure that the mother ever said anything, but you know, she never said really anything anyway. So um, the fact of the matter is, you know, the young lady felt like she could come to our house when she did. And and that's the way that Kelly, you know, wanted it to be that way. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, well, that's a, that's a really great story. And uh, has been, you know, my experience as well. And lots of the parents that I talk to, it's, it's a different kind of relationship with yeah. our kids and teens, isn't it? It's, it's so, I guess, respectful of them as human beings is really, I think right. what it comes down to. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. It does. 
It does. Okay. So after spending a lot of time helping my kids pursuing their passions, it eventually dawned on me that it was good for me to have interests and passions as well. <laughs> I really, it's not just for kids. Like, sure. you know, at first when you start, okay, they're coming home, they're not going to school anymore. You know, it's all about the kids. Unschooling is all about the kids and you think you're helping them and, and that's it. But it, it grows bigger, right? We start to realize uh, that that we can live this life too, and that it's actually important and valuable for us to live that life in that in our family if this is the lifestyle that we want to embrace. So you're not in your head. So that was your experience as well. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that we don't necessarily talk about um, from this perspective, and I guess I'll try to answer it the way that I'm getting ready to. And, you know, when they, when, when you are presenting yourself to your children, they're getting to know you as well. Yeah. When you make these decisions and you make these choices, you actually are allowing, you're being vulnerable for your children in a lot of cases. And so they're getting to know you as well. So they find you interesting. They find you um, hopefully they don't, they aren't scared, but yeah, there, there are those times where that has happened. But the fact of the matter is you're actually opening yourself up to them a little bit more as well. And so with that, I think there's a certain amount of, of, uh, comfort that as adults we feel because we've got all this baggage that maybe we needed to leave behind or we're just setting it aside and moving forward. Um, not that I didn't have uh, interest before. I've always been interested in music even before I knew Kelly or pretty much knew anybody. I mean, as a little kid, I sang Beatles songs. It's written in my mom's baby book about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, I don't remember that. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but it was something that I had. And, um, you know, those things that we may have brought brought forward or at least into the marriage and definitely into being parents, um, there's no need to forget stuff like that. I mean, I've gotten into cycling. Um, I've gone, you know, the equivalent of three times around the globe, probably the number of miles that I've done. I haven't done that many miles lately, but the fact of the matter is I'm interested in something. And so again, you're modeling something to your children that is not just go to work, come home, go to bed, eat, go to bed kind of thing. And Kelly's interested about everything. And her um, passion for things is is beyond anything I've seen and definitely something that the boys have benefited from for sure. Um, Cameron's, you know, launch that I talked about, you know, he's already involved with solid auctions and doing auctions and we did raffles and all that. You know, it's just... It's just interesting. It comes full circle. That that's for sure. So oh, yeah, I love that. It's such a good point, right? That I mean, we're living the lifestyle alongside them. Like as you said, we're modeling right. that excitement, not expecting our kids to be curious about the world when we're not, right? Because that right. that just leaves the message without any words, but leaves the message that you know this learning and curiosity is something for kids. Right. And, and right. that is not the message of lifelong learning, you know, that, that is at kind of at the heart of unschooling, right. That, that, you know, going back to, you know, prepping for college, right. When, when we toss out the timeline that we can, that we learn things when we're interested or when there's a reason or a need or, or something comes up, comes up. You know, we don't want to also leave the impression that that only works when you're a child too, right? It's, right, it's, right. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I just, it's something for everybody to embrace. And then, and once I, um, you know, realized that, you know, I had all sorts of interests and passions and, and, and then, and then work and I really enjoyed work and, and then having kids, um, you know, I found that parenting took up a lot of time. And, and so the things that I did that I still had some time to do, like, like reading, I've always loved reading and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I found we're being done outside kid hours. You know what I mean? 
So right. they weren't seeing that side of me. So it was so fun to realize, you know, kind of as part of that whole de-schooling time when we were getting to know one another, like you said, that, that vulnerability, that releasing the need for, you know, adults to know the answers, but instead to be curious and, and admitting when we didn't and helping them right. find it. And being excited about it too, it just opens up that whole, that all that curiosity again that kind of got buried, <laughs> right? Right, right? And then all of a sudden I was doing it with them and then I could get excited about my own things and they'd be like, oh, that's cool, mom. That's cool, mom. Or they'd know why I was excited. <laughs> I don't need them to also be excited, but it was so fun to say, hey, look at this, look at this. And we all just shared the stuff that, that tickled us, right? Right. Exactly. And that's how, that's how you create your own traditions as well. In other words, you don't necessarily see what everybody else is doing for this time of the year. That's something that you do because that's what's important to your family. And it could be, it could have been that it was what, you know, what mom did or what, you know, dad did or what Cameron did or what Duncan did. It didn't really matter. It's just, uh, we kind of like this. Let's keep this as part of what we do. And so, you know, one of the things we do is, you know, we, when we do have Thanksgiving and we, we, we do turkey, but for the, you know, the year in party for Christmas, it's something that's always different. It's always different because we want to try something new. So, you know, it's traditional for this. It's not so traditional for that. If you look at, you know, modern society or whatever. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's just, but I, again, I think it's, it's a, it's a coming together for that, what are the you know what are the traditions we're going to carry forward and stuff like that. The other thing I would say too is the children are going to be gone at some time. If you're not interesting to your mate, whatever that looks like, you know, hopefully that interest that got you there sustains you. But that's not always true. You have to kind of continue to evolve with that partner as well, um, so that you know the the 50 to 70 or 50 to 80, whatever years when you're by yourself, you know, that reading is good. Well, you come home and you're watching football all the time. Maybe that's not fun all, all the time, maybe fun some of the time. So it's also, be, you know, being interesting for your, you know, for your partner in that case. Yeah, that's, that's such a great point. And because for me anyway having having kids and moving to unschooling with them reawakened that side in that right. i i i remembered that i didn't have to get stuck in all those conventional constraints of of how an adult is defined right right and you're right that now that is me growing as a person you know, yes, as a as a result, kind of sparked through unschooling, but it's so much bigger than just that. You know, unschooling becomes just just life, right? It just becomes a lifestyle. It becomes how we live. It becomes a catalyst for our growth as as a person and within our family. So yeah, so it's not that we turn it off when our kids are no longer officially unschooling, right? And become adults. It's just right. how we all live our lives now, right? I love that. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Okay, so I'm curious, what has surprised you most about how unschooling unfolded in your lives? Hmm. What was most surprised? Um, um, I don't know. I, that, that's a, that's a good question. Um, not one that's easy for me to answer. Um, I think the whole process has been somewhat of a surprise for me until I got to the point where it wasn't. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is you know, my evolution, um, maybe because of the military, maybe because of how, how I grew up, maybe because of the way that I was. Um, that probably was, I think the, the look in the mirror, now that I think about it, looking in the mirror and going, seriously, seriously, um, that was probably the biggest thing for me. And just realizing that was one of the things, you know, when, I, when, we, when we did the conferences to see the dads who were starting from, you know, from Jump Street, you know, the children were two years old and yeah. they were doing all these great yeah. things with their kids and stuff like that. You know, and it wasn't that, you know, that we weren't, but we, were, we didn't start at that level. 
And so those things that they may have put aside a lot faster, those, those fathers and mothers would have put those things aside a lot faster. Yeah, it, it was pretty interesting to see. And, and learning from them um, was something that I think I, I think I found that I did more of, not necessarily with my peers who may have had children our same age and therefore we kind of you know, got together and we still do get together which is another, you know, fun story altogether. But the fact that you learn from the, you know, from the younger, you know, fathers who came into the meetings and stuff like that, um, I think that was a good thing. But I think for me, looking in the mirror and going, you know, and there were a lot of times I did it, and sometimes still do, sometimes yeah. still do. Yeah, so, that's a good point. I think, hopefully, I, yeah. <laughs> And I'm glad you brought up the conferences. That's where I wanted I wanted to ask you a bit about that too, um, because uh, that's something um, as new dads, you know, are starting to learn about unschooling. It's a possibility if they're, you know, some people travel far to get to conferences as well. Um, right. And there's there's some that may be close to you as well, but they may be wondering whether or not it's worth going to an unschooling conference, what they might get out of it. So I was hoping you could speak a bit about the benefits that you saw for dads over the years of going to conferences. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, at the time there weren't that many, that, that was a big thing. And people would, you know, people would travel, like you said, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it was Sandra Dodd or somebody else who said that, you know that you're an unschooler when you're you're willing to travel uh, the eight hours over uh, on a uh, Friday to get somewhere to see a friend of yours and then come back on a Sunday and drive that same you know eight hours that you're willing to do that or something to that effect that they're within that eight hour drive and you're like yeah of course we're going to go do that. So, well, yeah, we came but, down uh, to your conferences you know, in in South Carolina from Toronto. Yeah, I mean, and, and the funny thing is, yeah, I mean, so we, we took a look, I, th I think I did something right at the end, and I think we had, I think, so the, the biggest conference in terms of, of numbers was the Albuquerque conference, and I think there were people from 42 states in six countries, or four countries, or something like that, mm -hmm. and, you know, of course, they're coming from Canada because it was, you know, one of the closer countries yeah, to come, yeah. but I mean, people were coming in from Australia and Germany, and and it was like, okay, you know, this is kind of interesting. And New Zealand, um, Kelly still responds, you know, or still corresponds with somebody over in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and so it was just, but that was the only thing that 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 we had. And what I would say to new dads is, if you're not going to go to a conference, a big conference where you can see a lot of this happening at least get involved with your children at the local level, even if the local level is at your dining room table or whatever, you've got to get involved. Um, um, you know, it, it was a lot easier because we, you know, Kelly kind of had the idea of how to, how to do things as far as the conference, how she wanted to set it up, but there were certain things that she made sure of and that, and that was to have a dad's thing and, and, I was volunteered to do that. And so, you know, I learned a lot from that. I really did. Like I said, having the younger, um, you know, younger dads who've done it from the start um, to some of the best friends I've ever had, you know, now that I still, you know, some of them live in the close by and some of them, you know, are still far away. But, um, you know, we find lots of reasons to get together, whether it's online or, or whether we visit each other. The big thing is get involved with your kids' lives and getting, you know, if you're not already involved with the unschooling philosophy or lifestyle or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's up to you to do that. It's not up to anybody else for you. Yeah. I mean, you're back to, you're back to that. It's, it's, it's our choices, right? And right. yeah. And I can, I mean, I certainly know from the mom's perspective how valuable it was for me to make those connections with people um, who were uh, further along on the path so I could, you know, so they could share their experiences and I could have an idea of where we were going and they could talk about, you know, their experience when they first started, et cetera. Plus, I loved your point about the newer people too. Because number one, either they're asking great questions, 
right? That help me understand better what's going on or they're bringing right. their own take because they they're already at that place where they don't have a lot of that conventional baggage right so just connecting right. with other people even knowing like when i remember when i first discovered unschooling basically what i i did was i found a forum um in ontario and i saw there were people doing it it's like okay you know there are people doing it it's it's legal we can go like going to your conference was the first time I ever met an unschooler face to face, you know? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we, there weren't any, any locally, right. That, that I knew of. Yeah. And that's why I ended up starting a conference for a while. You know, I think I ran it for six years to start to have a place where people who were semi local mm -hmm. to be able to come and see one another, to see that there are other people doing it, you know? It, right. You know, it's not that you need their permission or anything like that, but it's, it's that connection, that understanding, just knowing that there are other people, um, you know, and, and to, to be able to share stories, you know, to hear right, their story right. and to share our stories. It was so valuable. Right. I think too. So if, if you consider the fact that a lot of this came about, you know, you know, for Kelly, she will say that she was, it was purposefully selfish to bring all the people that she liked to come speak at the conference yeah. so that people would come. Um, and that was, you know, what we did for the first one or people she was interested in who wrote well, who did whatever. But the fact of the matter is when you're on the message board, you know, unless you're responding to somebody specifically, nobody necessarily knows who you are responding to. And then are you going to respond by taking the bait from somebody who's you know, poo-pooing the idea. If you sit there face to face and talk to them, whether you're in a separate room, which there were all these opportunities, you know, the, 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 the conference coordinator's responsibility, in my opinion, is to give opportunities for all these things to come to fruition, no matter what that looks like, whether it's an auction, whether it's, you know, the talent show, whatever it is, give as many options as you can for people to do that. But the one-on-ones, when people were able to get together, those were invaluable, in my opinion. That that's what, and, and and if you don't have the group like you were talking about, or you don't have a conference, and and when we only had really one conference, that was tough. And I, I I know it was tough. And I think it's 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 our responsibility, or I felt it was our responsibility as parents to get out to see these people that we saw at the conference and not let that be the only time that we saw. Them. And we, and we tried to do that. Those pictures that I sent to you, those are mm -hmm. gatherings that we had years. Um, yeah. So, well, yeah. And, and like I said, I ended up, I remember Kelly gave a little, a little workshop at one of her conferences on starting a conference. Right. So a few of us went off with Catherine and Mary and I, and, you know, started conferences at the time and you know but it doesn't have even have to be something formal like that it can be you know starting right. like a camp out or or just opening up your home every couple of weeks and say hey you know we want to come over right. and play <clears throat> or chat or you know or a book club or you know anything that might that like you said you're just creating opportunities for people to connect right right you can't right. put expectations exactly. on it you never know but when you're creating opportunities, things can happen. Be patient with it, right? Right, right, right. And you probably shouldn't have any rules about it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll be here. You can have the structure, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, certainly be open-minded because <laughs> right. things because anything can happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I love that. Yeah. Okay, so I love asking this question. As an unschooling dad, what piece of advice would you like to share with dads who are considering or or maybe just starting out on their unschooling journey? Get involved. Get involved. Whether it's um, you know sharing your passion for baseball cards, sharing your passion for you know football and going to a game. Um, <clears throat> because you're being true to yourself and you're, you're exhibiting that and the involvement means whether you like it or not, the involvement means that you're trying 
you're, you're giving it an effort. And, you know, it may not happen. You know, I, I said, I looked in the mirror a lot and I continue to do that. And it may not happen right away, but, you know, it's worth your, your effort and your time and, and the investment that you're going to put into it if that's the way you see it. Um, if you don't get involved, um, <clears throat> I think what you do is you run. The, the biggest risk I think that you run is that, you know, you may not get to know your kids. And, and that thing that you probably, um, maybe that's something that you didn't really get to know the adults around you, whether they were your parents or whatever. You know, you're, you're, you're basically taking that and, you know, giving it to the next generation by doing it that way. Yeah. So oh, I love that. I love that. That's, that's a really great point because you're back to the opportunity for connection that we were talking about before, right. right? When you get involved, you're just, just having those opportunities, right? That's beautiful. Right. Right. Yeah. And, it, you know, I'll give you a, a little bit of an example for how that went for, you know, for me. So, you know, it was, I started cycling and you know, generally <clears throat> our family, when they get into something, they really get into something, <laughs> whether it's an individual or. <laughs> and so, but there were times, you know, as the boys got older, you know, I was like, I have not, I'm not spending a lot of time. I'm, I'm the, you know, breadwinner and Monday through Friday or whatever the case may be. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of feeling bad about you know going out for a ride. <laughs> of course, Kelly just she she had already observed it. She dart she said, "What are you worried about?" I said, "Well, I don't you know I'm not getting early to see. Well, they aren't up at ten o'clock, and you're out on the bike by six. <laughs> how many times have you you know how many times have you come home and they've, they've been awake?" And I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> All right, sure. So, I mean, what you do is you end up adapting and you realize that sunrises really are cool. You know, it's something that leads you down, you know, pardon the pun, but it leads you down a road that you may have known that sunrises were cool, but now sunrises are a part of your life for six years. You know, they're, they're damn cool. <laughs> Sorry to cuss, but they are, they really are. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me, Ben. It was so much fun. I loved catching up with yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. You as well. Thank you oh. for having me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, I, it's kind of fun to revisit it, isn't it? It's been a while since you've yeah. talked too much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I don't think, I think I was, uh, I was gray, but probably not this gray. <laughs> <laughs> But before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? <clears throat> um, probably through email. So uh, b ben b lovejoy forty seven at gmail dot com is is really good. If they've got any questions, that's awesome. Thanks so yeah. much, Ben. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, Pam. Bye.